League of Women. Welcome everyone. This is the uh, candidate forum sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Corvallis and the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP will be starting in a few minutes. Welcome everyone. This is the Corvallis Mayor and Corvallis City Council Candidate Forum. We will be starting in a few minutes. Hello everyone, I'm Connie Bozart, the president of the Corvallis League of Women Voters, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2022 candidate forum for the Corvallis Mayor and the Corvallis City Council. The webinar, this is a webinar, so you will um, not need to do anything. You um, uh, just sit back and listen. It is important to orient yourself to the question and answer box. During the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions of the mayoral candidates and the city council candidates. You will do that using the Q&A function. This is on the bottom of your screen. The chat box is not open, so remember to put your questions into the Q&A box. The event sponsors are the League of Women Voters of Corvallis and the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP. I will give, a, this is the first ranked choice voting for the city of Corvallis. So I'll give you a brief overview of just what ranked choice voting is. This is from the city of Corvallis website. So if you want more information or a little video about how ranked choice voting works, that's a good place to go for that information. So ranked choice voting is a system that gives voters the ability to rank candidates in order of preference, your first, your second, and third choices. This has been used once before in Benton County in the 2020 election. Using ranked choice voting, the candidate with the majority of first cho choice votes wins. If no candidate receives more than 50% of the first choice votes, then the candidate who receives the fewest first choice votes is eliminated from the race. And then the votes from the eliminated candidate are instantly recast to the voters next choice candidate. And then this process repeats itself until one candidate receives more than 50% of the votes or there are only two candidates left. And this sounds a little bit confusing but there is a nice video on the city of Corvallis website so I would refer you to that for further information. Um, before I'd also like to point out that tomorrow the League of Women Voters of Corvallis and the Lynn Bent NAACP are sponsoring another voter forum with candidates for county commissioner and there also will be a review of the ballot measures that will be on the Oregon state ballot. I'd like to now introduce Jason Dorsett, the president of the Lynn Benton NAACP. He will uh, briefly describe the agenda, introduce the candidates and be the moderator for the event. Jason. Thank you, Connie. And good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. 
Um, very briefly, I will go over the agenda for this evening. Um, we will begin uh, with our mayoral candidates um, with opening remarks from our three candidates. They will have three minutes each to introduce themselves and discuss what they see as the most important issues facing the city. We will then transition to our second round, which will provide an opportunity for our candidates to, to respond to three questions um, under one minute and a half each. From there, we will go to our third round in which we will have an opportunity to engage our audience in the Q&A. So please be sure to um, uh, share or place your questions that you have for each candidate um, in the Q&A section. Uh, we will wrap up this particular mayor or candidate forum at around 6.55 until 7. Uh, at this time, each candidate will have one minute each to provide some final comments. Following that, we will transition to our uh, candidates for city council. We have uh, several candidates across three wards, Ward 2, Ward 3, and Ward 9. Each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves and discuss what they see as the most important issues facing the city. We will then go to round two of the candidates form, council candidates form, in which we will provide each candidate with three questions. Following that, there will be an opportunity for community members to engage in Q&A with each candidate, in which each candidate will have one minute to respond to the questions. Roughly around 8.05 p.m., we will wrap things up. We will thank our each and every candidate for engaging with us on this evening, and thank you, our, our, our audience, for uh, engaging with us. All right, we ready to rock and roll? All right, we are ready to rock and roll. So again, welcome everyone. It is indeed my honor to serve once again as the moderator for these uh, both of these of these forums on this evening. We will start with our mayor candidates. Um, and again, please remember to put your questions in the Q and A portion on the bottom of Zoom. So, we will start with candidate Rowan. Uh, introduce yourself and discuss what you see as the most important issue facing the city. Thank you. So I would like to first thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. The League is 102 years old and over all these years, the League has helped voters make informed decisions. And especially now that our democratic institutions are under threat, the work of the League is more important than ever. And so thank you for inviting me to participate in the forum tonight. So I'm Rowan Hogue and I'm running for mayor of Corvallis. I'm a longtime Corvallis resident. I'm now retired, but I've worked as a project manager at Oregon Employment Department, as a software release manager at Hewlett Packard and a systems analyst at Oregon State University. And I served on the Corvallis City Council for eight years where I worked to improve the quality of life for the people of Corvallis. I worked with community members to locate the Corvallis Men's Shelter. I collaborated with OSU to address neighborhood mobility issues. I championed the fire department, 911 dispatch center and police to improve public safety. And I advocated for the Majestic Theater, the Aquatic Center, library in our, in our city parks. The pandemic has made us realize how much we depend on one another. You know, we need to address climate change community mental health resources and affordable housing. You know, this I believe that overall the city is doing well. You know, Corvallis has sound finances, good infrastructure and good livability, but there are land use changes people are unaware of. There is less public input on annexation and zoning. You know, people are losing a say on what happens to their neighborhoods. The issue now is how to sustain the livability the community has come to expect. Yeah, I'm running for mayor to help make Corvallis an even better place to live, work, and raise a family. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you. All right, moving on to our second candidate. Um, Charles, your time starts now. Charles, your Charles, you're up and your camera is off. Oh, actually, my camera's on, but my mic was muted. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank Sorry. you for that. 
Uh, so thank you, Jason. And thank you for pointing out that I was muted. Uh, rookie mistake. After all this time, you think I'd have that down. Um, I'd also like, I'd like to start by, of course, thanking the uh, League of Women Voters of Corvallis and the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP for hosting this. This is very important to inform voters of the choices they have to make. Um, my name is Charles Mon, and I'm running to be your first choice for mayor of Corvallis. I moved my family here nearly 15 years ago. Uh, I was raising my kids, and we were living in poverty. Even though both my wife and I worked full-time jobs, um, we struggled to pay bills. And, and unfortunately, we lived here in Corvallis, and we learned early on that the services that the city provided provided a better life for my children from the parks and rec programs uh, like the Osborne Aquatic Center to the library, which became a, a regular Saturday stop for us after the farmer's market. I'm running to be your Corvallis mayor because the city's gonna be facing serious problems in the near future from uh, we're in a housing crisis, we need additional housing, uh, unhoused is on the rise, and we're, we have a climate crisis that's gonna affect our city with lots of people coming here as climate refugees. And that's just one of many, uh, a few of many issues. And during that, I want to protect the services that provided so much to my family and my children. Um, I, I've, my day job is I'm a compliance analyst for Oregon Housing and Community Services. Before that, I was a community manager for affordable housing in downtown Corvallis. So I've witnessed firsthand how these, how these issues impact the people of Corvallis. And I want to serve as your mayor to continue the work that I started and uh, address these issues firsthand. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, Charles. All right, moving on to our third candidate for mayor, uh, Andrew. Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to everyone for watching and participating tonight and those who will be watching later. And also thank you to, to our hosts, the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP and the League of Women Voters of Corvallis for tonight's forum. My name is Andrew Struthers. I'm currently serving as your Ward 9 City Councilor, Council Vice President, and Chair of our Metro Planning Organization, Campo. I'm a father of two wonderful kids, one who's just starting kindergarten this year, and the other one who is celebrating their one-year birthday tonight. Happy birthday, Sheldon. I have been married um, for over nine years to my amazing wife, who has been my anchor and support as I serve our community and city. As our city continues to move forward, we will need a mayor who will show up, know how to facilitate and lead difficult conversations, be responsive to community members, and know how to get things done. Over my four years as an elected counselor, I have worked to get our 911 communication district passed so we can have a modern day fully staffed 911 center. Working with other city councilors like Councilor Hyatt Lytle and members of our local NAACP on securing city funding for the Hate Bias Response Initiative which is now becoming more of a regional approach versus just Corvallis focus, but we are still the primary leaders for that. However, we have a lot of work to be done going forward. Uh, we need to increase our housing, housing capacity, which means we need to grow and change. We need more housing for our most vulnerable population with shelters and permanent supportive housing. We need to increase all housing options like mixed use project, manufactured homes, duplexes, triplexes, and the other housing types. We also need to bolster our economic development by supporting the businesses we have here now and fostering new businesses. We need to create new jobs and help our local workforce, for example, by ensuring housing options here. Supporting families and community members who cannot shop in Corvallis impacts their affordability and livability here in our city. Within Corvallis and Benton County, I know that many families cannot shop for their kids, especially for clothes, shoes, car seats, and other essentials. Additionally, we have transportation issues that need addressing, issues like pedestrian bicycle safety, county roads like West Hills Road, or safety and congestion issues like Highway 99, Highway 20, and Highway 34. As a city, we see on average 20 to 22,000 individuals coming into Corvallis on a daily average, and those are primarily commuters who work here, do business here, or, but they want to live here. Finally, the last thing I would like to add is we have work to, work to do to address the city's climate impact which is interrelated to all the issues facing the city. We should ask ourselves, how will this parking decision impact climate and the environment? How will providing more housing reduce the number of vehicle, vehicle miles traveled? Let's integrate climate decisions into every policy, like focusing on getting more housing options so folks can live here, requiring fewer cars and cars and traveling and getting more businesses so people can shop here. These significant issues, I, Jason. Oh, thank you. And that's where I was actually ending. 
Thank you, Andrew. All right, transitioning to um, the three questions that again, we will ask each mayoral candidate to respond to. Give me one second here while I set my timer. Um, and we will start with Andrew. Again, one minute and 30 seconds. Let me get my clock here, my timer. Thank you all for bearing with me. Don't forget to put your questions in the chat and the Q&A portion. All right, we'll start with Andrew. Question one, your time will, will start after I read the first question. <clears throat> What are the actions that you will commit to as mayor to address the urgent needs of houselessness in Corvallis? Your time starts now. Uh, thank you for this critical question, which is a, a significant issue facing our city. And also thank you for how you asked the question, specifically asking what as mayor I can commit to, which means what I know I can do, achieve and honor as mayor. I wasn't sure all voices are at the table and heard about the concerns before making any decision. That includes neighbors, community members, service providers, and local business owners. I will be an advocate for more in state federal assistance and funding for major projects within our community, increasing staffing to support the core response team, which responds to mental health calls specifically, take a lead in the joint coordinated office advisory board and be a leading voice for the city, this joint office comes from the Oregon House Bill 4123, which provides a million dollars over the next two years for collaborative efforts between cities and county. Uh, support and work to achieve all the home opportunity planning and equity or the HOPE Board policy recommendations. Work to support and advocate for more housing options, including shelters, permanent supportive housing and affordable housing projects, similar to projects the City Council has already supported and at times helped finance. Work to try new solutions that get presented to the city ensure solutions have a geographic equity in mind so that all solutions are focused on a single area of our city and stay committed to the concept of coordinated entry. And most importantly, I said already, work with city partners, service providers, community members, and businesses on solutions that support everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. All right, uh, our, respond, our second responder will be Charles. I will read the question again. And I and the clock will start after I read the question. What are the actions that you will commit to as mayor to address the urgent needs of houselessness in Corvallis? Your time starts now. Thank you so much for this question. This issue is at the heart of everything I've done for the last 10 years. As I stated, I was a community manager for affordable housing in downtown Corvallis uh, for persons with uh, seniors and persons with disability. And I saw firsthand how uh, stable, clean, good housing affects people's lives. Since then, for the last three years, I've served uh, since its inception on the HOPE Advisory Board's Executive Committee, helping to draft the bylaws and the direction that the HOPE Board would take. I have also, my, also my day job again, I work for Oregon Housing and Community Services as a compliance analyst, which ensures that housing is clean, safe, and stays affordable and is, and is rented to those who need it. We have a serious need in Corvallis where our teachers, our city workers, and our bus drivers can't afford to live here. This is contributing to um, excessive uh, single occupancy vehicles coming and going from our city, which contributes to climate change. It impacts our, our local businesses because people aren't spending their paychecks here. They're going home where they live in Monroe, Philomath. I will dedicate, as I have for the last 10 years, to direct the council to feel empowered to make decisions around this issue. Uh, we need to start thinking um, outside the box. We need to speak with the providers. We need to speak with the experts in the field, look at data, and focus on data-driven results, best practices, and a way to address this in a meaningful way, not just with words, but with action. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. We'll move on to our third candidate, um, well, our third speaker. Um, and uh, the question, what well, the time will start after I read the question, Rowan. What are the actions that you will commit to as mayor to address the urgent needs of houselessness in Corvallis? Your time starts now and your camera is off. It's still on. It's on. There you go. Time starts now, Rowan, go. All right, thank you very much. 
So when I was first elected to city council, I proposed a city council goal to address homelessness. I always thought that the city could do more to help those in need. And while on the, and while on the council, I worked with community members for the location of the Corvallis Men's Shelter. Barbara Ross, who was my neighbor and former Oregon State Representative and Benton County Commissioner, helped me with my campaign when I first ran for city council. And I was on the city council when Barbara advocated for housing first. The goal of this program is to help people get housed and then bring the needed services to them. Though this program existed in other cities, it had never been done before in Corvallis. Barbara was a strong advocate for evidence-based decision-making. She presented the data and the facts regarding the Housing First programs in other cities. Housing First in Corvallis was a success. It successfully helped others and it was successfully introduced into the community. This evidence-based approach is one that other individuals and organizations can emulate by looking at what works in other cities and then making a case for doing something similar in Corvallis. There's strong support in our community to help others with programs that have a proven track record of being successful. We can look at what other cities are doing and see what works and then do something similar. And there is a need for affordable housing for everyone. As a mayor, I will collaborate with the county and help facilitate these discussions, which will give the county, city council, and the community the data information needed to make informed decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. All right, for our second question, Charles will start us off at one minute and 30 seconds. Charles, question is this, from a justice and equity lens, how does accountability look to you as a city manager? Your time starts now. Again, thank you for this question. I think how it looks needs to be by action. We need to back up the things we say as a city. We have several statements and advisor boards on this issue as a city, but yet when the decision comes down to it, you know, as we saw recently, we don't look at things that way. We don't act, act on those issues. And we need to. We need to be more than just words, more than just statements of position, but take action when it comes to decision making. All decisions we make as a city needs to be viewed through this lens. Uh, justice means several things. It could be environmental justice, social justice, economic justice. And as a city, we need to put that for right in front for all decisions we make. I, we do so on the HOPE Advisory Board. We've had trainings on this issue, and we view that through when we make appointments to the advisory board, when we have uh, what's coming up on, on our agendas, we always view it through an equity lens. We also do that on my day job uh, in Oregon Housing and Community Services. So I feel it's more than just a phrase, it's more than just a word, and it's more than just a document. We need to take action and show that we are applying this theory and this process to all decisions. Thank you, Charles. All right, uh, Rowan, you're up next. I will read the question again and you will have one minute and 30 seconds to respond. From a justice and equity lens, how does accountability look to you as the city mayor? Your time starts now. Well, diversity is a core value of the city of Corvallis. Imagine Corvallis 2040, which is the community vision for the city, describes an ongoing goal to promote education, communication, and understanding of cultural differences. And Corvallis has a history of welcoming and empowering people with diverse backgrounds, cultures, and abilities. And Corvallis adopted a civil rights ordinance in 1992. In 2006, there was a city charter amendment to ensure equal protection, treatment, and representation of all persons without discrimination. And the city maintains two advisory boards dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's the King Legacy Board, which promotes the ideas of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And the Community Police Advisory Board, which provides a process to review any complaints against the police department. The goal is to build trust and enhance communication between the police and all members of the community. When I was on city council, I advocated for a council goal for more funding for public safety. This resulted in additional funding for police training and community resource officers so that we would be able to continue to provide the high quality level of service that everyone in our community expects and deserves. It's important to promote fairness across all aspects of the city. This includes economic, educational, and workplace opportunities. It's important that everyone's voice is heard and respected. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. We will now um, ask 
candidate Andrew, same question. From a justice and equity lens, how does accountability look to you as city mayor? Your time starts now. Thank you. Uh, if elected Mayor Corrales, having that justice and equity lens is crucial to me, even now as a city councilor. For me, just, justice and equity mean that we plan, create, and evaluate our policy and local laws equally with a focus on our institutionally underserved and marginalized communities. We must ensure that our policies and programs are available so everyone has equal access regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, income status, or other identities. Every city issue and action should be looked at from different perspectives, acknowledging that a seemingly minor decision can significantly impact different individuals or groups. The best way to do this is to ensure diversity in the views that the council, the mayor, and the staff hear. Sometimes this means actively seeking input from our community. Public officials are accountable to all people affected by, by their decisions, regardless of whether they vote. Focusing on accountability means that there, where there is injustice or inequity, it needs to be called out for what it is and brought to everyone's attention. We need to address what is causing that injustice or, in, or inequity at its root, whether it's a local law or policy. Um, a good example of, of this for me right now is, is mandating a home energy score for all home sellers. Many in our community, especially homeowners with fixed or low income felt left out of the policy discussion. Um, the majority of the council, myself included, included, listened and decided for now to send the question to the voters. This is an example where we need to be reaching out on policy decisions and having that justice and equity lens. Thank you, Andrew, that is your time. Uh, third question, we'll start with Rowan. One minute and a half and your time will start after I read the, the question. <clears throat> The perception has been that South Corvallis is an afterthought to leadership of to the leadership of our city. How will you, as mayor, work to better understand the needs of South Corvallis and help to develop its potential based on the expectations and aspirations of the residents? Your time starts now. Well, when I first came to Corvallis 29 years ago, I lived in South Corvallis. I rented a house near Willamette Park. That park was my dog's favorite place. It's an off-leash park where he could meet lots of other dogs and go swimming in the river in the summer. The park also has over 200 different species of birds. It's the second best place to bird watch in all of Oregon, second only to Finley Wildlife Refuge. And today I'm in South Corvallis almost every day. I continue to run and go for walks in Willamette Park year round. And I'm a longtime member of the co-op and shop at the South Co-op store. And this summer I went on an edible garden tour of South Corvallis where I saw many amazing backyard gardens. South Corvallis is a great place to live, but it has its own unique issues. When I was on the city council, I worked to address some of these issues. I was involved in the urban renewal for South Corvallis. I worked to get the Eric Austin bike path behind the co-op to improve bicycle and pedestrian safety. I participated in many meetings to address air quality emissions and noise issues from the Hollingsworth and Bose h and site in South Corvallis. And I advocated that a bike path should be built alongside the railroad tracks as an alternate way to connect South Corvallis with the rest of the city. There's still more work that needs to be done. We need to look at improving roads in South Corvallis to make them more bicycle and pedestrian friendly. And we need to look at improving some of the local streets in South Corvallis neighborhoods that were built with no drainage or sidewalks. But it's not just South Corvallis. We need to look at how we can address neighborhood livability issues throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Same question to uh, candidate Andrew. <clears throat> the perception has been, uh -oh. sorry, lost my questions. There we go. The perception has been that South Corvallis is an afterthought to the leadership of our city. How will you, as the mayor, work to better understand the needs of South Corvallis and help to develop its potential based on the expectations and aspirations of the residents? Your time starts now. Thank you uh, for the question about South Corrales, a crucial part of our city. Let me start by saying I believe in no, sir, South Corrales is an important and so essential part of our community and city. As mayor, the main thing I can do to understand the needs of South Corrales better is by actively listening and engaging with the community. That is an ideal trait for any leader. Do not come in assuming you know what is best for everyone. 
The people of South Corrales know the area because they live there now. I have engaged when possible on South Corrales issues like pedestrian and bicycle safety as a counselor and a member of Campo. As future planning for Highway 99 continues, I plan to be engaged directly with that work, including attending public engagement processes similar to the one that's been happening in most recent in August of 2021. As the urban real district begins to see revenue to get to the point of funding major projects, we need to ensure the city is engaging the public on how the district plan will be implemented. Two things I'm happy to say I have already worked on. First, with our economic development office after they received ARPA funding for an innovative food hub to be placed in South Corrales. And then second, when updating our regional transportation plan for Campo, we focused on major corridors in our region. Highway 99 in South Corrales was identified as a significant focus on pedestrian bicycle safety. Corrales should not, or excuse me, South Corrales should not be considered an afterthought of city leadership, and I will work to ensure that changes in the future and continues to be part of the short and long-term planning um, of our city. Thank you, Andrew. That is your time. Uh, Charles, candidate Charles. The perception has been that Corvallis, excuse me, the perception has been that South Corvallis is an afterthought to the leadership of our city. How will you, as the mayor, work to better understand the needs of South Corvallis and help to develop its potential based on the expectations and aspirations of the residents? Your time starts now. Thank you. Well, what better way to understand the needs of South Corvallis than to elect a mayor that lives in South Corvallis? I have lived in South Corvallis for the last 10 years. Um, I first ran for city council in 2016 because I heard from my neighbors on the south, on the west side of South Corvallis that they weren't being represented by their city council. I ran again in 2018 for the same reason, and I've served on city council for the last four years up until moving a block out of the ward, yet still in South Corvallis. I, I love South Corvallis. It's been my home. I've been connected with it. I served on the Living Southtown Steering Committee which started the initial work which led into the urban renewal district for South Corvallis. South Corvallis has a lot of issues that aren't being addressed. We, we lack uh, restaurants, we lack good transportation options, we lack, um, we lack low speed limits and safety. I have worked with Councillor Lytle to bring some attention to these issues. We have held joint ward meetings in, around here around um, disaster preparedness because a lot of Southtown residents feel like that we're not gonna be served by uh, the cities you know, fire department and emergency services because we get disconnected in events of floods and possible earthquakes. Uh, I have worked with ODOT and spoken with ODOT and, and participated in their forums about how to improve safety on the 99 corridor in South Corvallis to slow traffic, to provide walkable paths to cross from the west side to the east side because we are disconnected. I believe in building community and I've worked for, the, for years now, for 10 years in South Corrales to be part of that community and to build it up and to make it a stronger community. And I will continue to do so as mayor. Thank you, Charles. That is our time. Uh, now we will transition to some Q and A from our, um, citizens, our residents, excuse me, that are watching on this evening. Uh, and I will read the question and we will have, see, um, we will have Rowan um, uh, start first um, and then uh, Andrew and Charles. All right, question one. Thank you all for your patience as I multitask. I have like three screens up. I, cell phone, iPads, a lot going on over here. So thank you for your patience. Uh, question one, what actions, what actions will you encourage in order to ensure a robust public process in Corvallis? What actions will you encourage in order to ensure a robust public process in Corvallis? And Rowan, we'll start with you, one minute. So what I would do first is I would bring back all our advisory boards. When I was on city council, we had a lot of um, public advisory boards that members of the public could participate in. And since I left city council, they had all been voted, the city council voted to get rid of all of them. And so there's very little now public participation in the process. And it also makes it difficult when you have a new uh, idea or policy comes forward to the council, there's no advisory group or board to send that to. 
I think it would be a very good idea to, to structure the advisory boards based on the, the 2040 vision statement, which has different categories. And for each category, there, should, there could be a public advisory board for that category. And so I think it's really critical, and especially in Corvallis, where people like to participate in, the, in local government, is that we have um, these, these um, venues for people, for, for boards and commissions that people can join to participate in and make recommendations. Thank you. Uh, same question uh, to uh, Andrew. Uh, what actions will you encourage in order to ensure a robust public process in Corvallis? The time starts now. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, public par participation, public process is important to Corvallis. It's, it's what we do. I, I think the first thing is we need to work to educate not only the, the next council, the next mayor, and the next and, and our community on what we adopted um, as, as a council, um, particularly uh, the International Association of Public Participation and how that is supposed to help drive um, decision-making process, not just for the city, but for the community as a whole. Uh, one of the things I, I would like to see come back from um, our advisory boards, and this is a conversation that I've been having with um, some business owners and some and our community members, um, ever since the closing of our downtown Corrales Association, is we need to bring back our downtown advisory board. There is no way now, uh, directly for business owners to communicate or work directly with the city. Um, unfortunately, with the closing of the Downtown Corvallis Association, that, that has sort of gone away and has moved over to the chamber and, and there's different relationships there. Uh, one of the things I pride myself on, um, I've been on the council for four years, um, three of those four years, not counting 2020 really because of COVID, I held war meetings, um, whether they were in person or they were remote and working with counselors to do the same thing. Thank um, you, thank you, candidate Andrew. Thank you. Um, Candidate Charles, same question. What actions will you encourage in order to ensure a robust public process in Corvallis? Your time starts now. So I find myself agreeing with my one of my opponents here. I agree with Rowan. I think we need to look at our advisory boards again. When that, when that restructuring advisory boards took place, I was told that we would not reduce public participation, which I value at highly. But what the outcome was is disappointing, and I feel like we have reduced the amount of public participation, and we've lost some institutional knowledge that our community has. We have we have a community full of very intelligent people and very passionate people on ideas, and we need to hear from them on all decisions we make. I plan on holding regular forums throughout the throughout the community to hear people's ideas and engage the public directly, probably quarterly. I think would be something reasonable that I could manage. But I, yeah, I'd like to reevaluate our advisory board structure and hear from the community on what they would like to see. Thank you, Charles. We're going to start with you for this second question, followed by Andrew and followed by Rowan. What grade would you give the city on achieving the community's climate goals. Again, what grade would you give the city on achieving the community's climate goal? Your, your time starts now, Charles. That's a tough one. I used to feel like we were on top of addressing climate needs and, and listening to our climate advisory uh, board. Um, but recently, there was something that was presented as a due pass. There were six years in the making for the home energy score, um, and I was fully supporting it. Yet council could, didn't last seem to lack the political willpower to make a decision on it. And instead, one of my opponents decided to send it back to voters, which is going to cost the city thousands, potentially thousands of dollars. And we're going to see a lot of special interest groups spending their money to combat this. It's council's role to vote on these issues, to make decisions. That's what the council is elected for. So I will work to empower council to make bold decisions to support our climate action plan and move our city forward to be a shining beacon in the state. Thank you, Charles. Andrew? Uh, what grade would you give the city on achieving the community's uh, climate goals? Your time starts now. Uh, so questions, you know, specific to a grade. Um, first thing that pops in my head is probably a B minus, maybe a B if, if I'm being generous. Um, but we have a lot of work that we need to do around the transportation issues, around um, getting more housing here so we can get cars off the road and, and, and addressing our parking issues. Um, if we start doing that, then we can really start addressing the community-wide issues of of climate action and working with our, um, our, our our groups here in the city. We just have work that needs to be done um, to get to, to achieve the larger goal. Thank you. Rowan, same question. Um, what grade would you give the city on achieving its community climate goals? Well, I was on the city council when we created this goal to have climate change, and we wanted to have some bold action be, be done to address this major issue that's, that's affecting our planet. 
it's really um, the climate change and nuclear war are the two big issues uh, on a global level. And I would give an A for effort. We have a climate action plan. The team that worked on that worked very hard to get that in place. But I would give a D for implementation. I think the city has not stepped up to the plate to get those climate action goals implemented. And I believe the role of mayor is to help facilitate that and help make the team successful in getting their plan implemented and turning um, good ideas into, into good results. Thank you so much. Um, next question, we will start with uh, Andrew. Andrew, how can the city help integrate the many university students into the city life? How can the city help integrate the, the many university students into city life? Your time starts now. Thank you. As, as a former um, student of Oregon State and actually the ASOC president, the first thing is just engaging with the students, going out and talking with them, uh, going to um, community events. Just recently, there was the Beaver Community Fair. The city could have it ha has a table there. I know I saw a couple of community organizations there, like the Corral Sustainability Coalition, Visit Corrales, and they were engaging with students. So just start starting at that point and just being there where the students are at their events and inviting them to have conversations with, with city staff, with elected, and telling them what how they can be engaged. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see, uh, Rowan, same question. How can the city integrate, um, excuse me, integrate the many university students into, into the city life? Well, the university students are a big part of Corvallis, about half the population of the city. And when I was on Corvallis City Council, I pushed to have a goal that we work on town gown issues with, the, with OSU and the city to in, integrate and address some, some of the issues that students may have in terms of substandard housing, uh, in, in terms of uh, you know, transportation issues in terms for students to get around. I was the liaison to ASOSU. I met monthly with, uh, with that group on campus. I was had um, also worked with former president of OSU, Ed Ray, to address some of these issues. And so I believe that we have to take a very active role in getting the students engaged. And we cannot simply wait for the students to come to the council meetings. We have to actually get out there and go to where the students are to listen to, to their concerns. Thank you, Rowan. Uh, Charles, how can the city help integrate the many university students into, into city life? It's a difficult process because the students change regularly, right? We don't have the same students here all the time. But over the last uh, you know, 10 years, I've worked with students. I, I currently am working with um, some students right now that are part of Sunrise Corvallis. Students are eager to get involved. They just need an avenue to do so. So I actually agree with what uh, both Andrew and Rowan are saying. We need to be there when they arrive. We need to engage them and invite them to become part of the city. We also need to find a way to get the community to reach out and welcome them to be, to be their neighbors. Right now, there seems to be a bit of hostility because, between some neighborhoods and the student population. We need to work with both sides, hear it out, and bring them together to come up with solutions to address these needs then the students will feel heard and they'll feel like this is home and they'll be part of the community and hopefully get more involved in, in some of the needs we have. There's plenty of volunteer opportunities within the city and within organizations throughout the city. And I, I think the mayor's job should be, be there to greet them when they come into our OSU. Thank you, thank you. Jason, you've muted yourself. Thank you. Uh, candidates, I'm going to try to get through as many questions as, as, as we can here for the next 13 minutes. So if you could just respond as quickly as possible, that'd be great. Um, let's see. Okay. And mm, Corvallis has a weak mayor system where the mayor only votes to break ties. How do you get, how do you get election priorities accomplished without a regular vote? And we'll start with uh, Rowan. One of the roles of mayor is to really to help facilitate and bring people together to get to get things accomplished. And the mayor can activate, uh, uh, advocate for different groups and bring uh, collaboration and also can speak to, to different uh, issues within the city to bring to, to make presentations to the city council. And so the mayor can play the role behind the scenes to make to make people successful. And, and that's why I see the role of the mayor. Thank you. Okay, uh, Charles, uh, Corvallis has a weak mayor system where the mayor only votes in, in, uh, in form of a tie, in, in the case of a tie. How do you get your election priorities accomplished without a regular vote? Well, although it's true the mayor doesn't have a regular vote, 
But the mayor has a platform and a responsibility to educate the council to be to be empowered and ready to make decisions. As mayor, I can work with council. We can have robust discussions, present the ideas in a way that provide them all the information, work with staff to give clear outcomes of those decisions, whether pro or con, and prepare council to fill their role as policy and decision makers. Their, their goal is to set direction and policy for the staff to carry out. And if we empower them with the information to make solid decisions, they will make those decisions. And as mayor, I will fight for the issues I care about. But in the end, it will be a council that makes those decisions it's up to the voters to choose the people they want to represent them on this council. Thank you, Charles. Andrew, how do you get, how do you get election priorities accomplished without a regular vote if elected as mayor? Thank you. And yes, we do have a weak mayor system here, but our mayor is elected at large, which means they are the face of the city. They're out there doing the work for the people on an at large basis and working directly with counselors, meeting with them on regular um, intervals so they can understand what the mayor's priorities are, understand what the council's priority. They also sort in, in a way they don't necessarily set every single agenda, but they, they have that, that that filter to set the agenda, working with council leadership and city staff of what, what issues are coming forward next. Um, and so you really are working from that. Also working regionally and statewide with other with county officials, other cities, and, and our state statewide elected officials. That that is work that the mayor can really be doing to drive um, issues to, to be resolved. Thank you. All right, Andrew, we're coming back your way. Um, this is let me see. Da, 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 da. Okay, what would your view be on di on divesting city of Corvallis investments? from makers of civilian and military weaponry. I'll read that again. What would be your view? What would your view be on divesting city of, city of Corvallis investments from makers of civilian and military weaponry? Your time starts now. Thank you. And, and actually this is uh, something that's coming up in a, in a near future uh, city council meeting. Um, I don't have the date right in front of me, uh, but it's a resolution and we're, being asked to do that as a city council. And I've met with a group that's pushing for this. Um, I've They've actually implemented some language in their resolution that I asked or, 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 or recommended. And they've done that. And based off the last resolution I saw, I was something I could support. And I think it's something we could be moving forward with. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Ro, Rowan, excuse me. Um, what would your view be on divesting city of Cavallis investments from makers? of civilian, uh, civilian and military weaponry. Your time starts now. Well, first of all, the city of Corvallis does not have that much money invested in this area. But I want to be very careful when we think about Ukraine, it's military weapons that are mainly coming from the United States and also from the, uh, NATO that are protecting the people there from what's happening. And so it's a double-edged sword, but at the same time, that's what's keeping, uh, helping trying to keep people alive in, in the terrible situation that's happening in Ukraine. And so I think this is something that needs to be looked at, but there is a role in, in for, for, for providing defensive weapons. Thank you. Charles, same question. What would your view be on divesting City of Cavallis investments from makers of civilian to military weaponry? The time starts now. It's pretty simple. The City of Corvallis should not profit from death. I worked with former City Councilor Bill Glassmeyer on this and trying to get it before council. I've spent months over the, throughout this year trying to get it before council and I'm happy it's finally going to happen. I completely support divesting from from death from war and military weapons. Thank you. And this will be our last question of 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 the Q&A. It's a loaded one, so please bear with me. <clears throat> Corvallis has been losing more and more open space to development. This development, especially in Northwest Corvallis, it's not low income, rather it is geared toward the most affluent members of the community. If you are elected as mayor, how will you work to combat this ongoing development to upper income housing and the loss of open space? And we will start with Charles, your time starts now. Well, this one's very difficult to really address because we want we need more housing. We are in a housing crisis, but I agree that what we really need is affordable housing. So I think we need that we need we don't want sprawl. We need to create focus on density. I think we need to work with uh, the community, especially on the fringes of Corvallis, and have them work with the planning department, have discussions around how we can 
control the type of growth we have and grow in a way that keeps us from losing that open space while focusing on development of additional housing that we need, so desperately need. Finding ways to focus on promoting affordable housing, diverse housing, different types of communities from, you know, uh, multifamily housing to quadplexes, duplexes, and even cl cottage clustered homes. We need to start implementing these ideas and we need to work with the community to make it happen in a way that benefits all of us. Thank you. All right, Rowan, you're next. Um, Corvallis has been losing more and more open space to development. This development, especially in Northwest Corvallis is not low income, rather it is geared towards the most affluent members of the community. If you are elected as mayor, how will you work to combat these ongoing development to, to upper income housing and the loss of open space? Your time starts now. Yeah, so thank you for this question. This is one of the main driving factors of why I'm running for mayor. You know, there are land use changes that are happening that our control is being taken away at the local level. So there's less public input on annexation and zoning. So there's less and less that the city can do in terms of managing our, the growth that's happening in Corvallis. There's a strong need for affordable housing, and, but we need to be smart in about the type of housing that's being built in terms of when we have density that we're, we're actually having density that can serve everybody, you know, families, um, young people, um, and not just focus on a student type of housing where you have five bedrooms and five bathrooms and they're rented by the bedroom. And so this is an area we also need to make sure we have transportation and infrastructure put in place to support the, the housing that's needed. Thank you. And finally, uh, Andrew, Corvallis has, a, uh, excuse me, Corvallis has been losing more and more open space to development. This development especially is happening in Northwest Corvallis. It is not low income, rather it is geared toward the most affluent members of the community. If you are elected as mayor, how will you work to combat this ongoing development to upper income housing and the loss of open space? Your time starts now. Thank you. Um, we are in a, in a housing crisis, not just here in Corvallis, but across the state. There's new numbers saying we need to have 150,000 new homes built just in our state just to meet our current population projections. Um, you know, the first thing we need to be doing is reaching out to our uh, out to our state legislators and and, this, and other housing authorities, get more state funding in, into Corvallis um, to build affordable housing projects, advertising and putting out there that our construction ex excise tax that helps build affordable housing. We need to promote and support mixed use projects so that you can have your businesses downstairs and you can have more housing going upwards. And that brings um, that gets um, more cars off the street that can get people moving around within the businesses. And, and ultimately that gets, um, that can protect open spaces because now you're not having to take away new land to build more development. You can just build upwards. And so there, there's a difference between sprawling out and taking away open spaces, or we can be looking to go up. And if we want to protect our open spaces, we need to start building up. Thank you. Thank you all so much for those questions. Um, now we're moving to the um, final comments from the candidates, mayoral candidates. You will each have one minute uh, to wrap up uh, and say why folks should vote for you. And we will start with Andrew Strutters. One minute. Your time starts now. Thank you uh, for tonight to our hosts and thank you for listening, being here, everyone. I want to close out with some um, closing with some thoughts here. First, I am currently serving as your city councilor, council vice president and metro planning organization chair. Um, I do have a full-time family and a full-time job, but I promise I will dedicate myself to the city as I do now as a city councilor if I'm elected mayor. I have shown that I can lead and facilitate significant issues facing the city. I do work statewide uh, with involvement in the League of Oregon City, specifically the League's legislative policy committees. I have shown with my support for my campaign that I can work locally and regionally, which we need to address some significant issues in the future. I am the candidate focused on, on the city as a whole, all residents, all kinds of families, and all the complex and interrelated issues like housing, economic development, transportation, and climate change. Uh, please visit my website at struthersforcorvallis.com to learn more about me and my campaign. And thank you um, for being here tonight. Thank you, Andrew. Best of luck. Uh, candidate two, Rowan, final comments. One minute. The time starts. All right. We are all inspired by others. You know, one person that has inspired me was Eleanor Roosevelt. She had insights into the quality of a good leader. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt lived a remarkable life. She was an outspoken advocate for civil rights, for the rights of World War II refugees, and for the expanded role of women in the workplace. And she pressured the United States to join the United Nations, and she became its first delegate and served as the first chair on the Commission of Human Rights. 
Later, when she reflected on her life, she made several observations. She said that to be a good leader, you need to listen and to have empathy, and that there is very little you can do yourself. You need to work with others. And this is how I see the role of mayor, listening and having empathy, being able to walk in someone else's shoes, and to work with others to bring people together to achieve common goals. I'm running for mayor to help make Corvallis an even better place to live, work, and raise a family. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rowan, and best of luck to you. Uh, Charles, one minute, your time starts now. I appreciate all the questions and engagement tonight. I'm running for mayor and I'm the only candidate who's been endorsed by the Oregon League of Conservation Voters, Sunrise Corvallis, Our Revolution Corvallis Allies, the Benton County Democrats, and the Pacific Green Party. I have worked with many, many allies throughout the years and I will continue to work for, the, for these allies and for all members of the city of Corvallis. Uh, the questions that were asked tonight focused around housing, focused around homelessness, the environment, divesting from war, and specifically South Corvallis. I'm a South Corvallis resident. I have fought on these issues, and I will continue to fight these issues, and I'm the only candidate who works in affordable housing and has a frontline experience of how affordable housing affects people's lives. And this is what I focus on every day and will continue to focus on. Please vote for me, your first choice for mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, and thank all of our mayoral candidates on this evening. Uh, we will take a two minute pause so I can get some water and then we will transition to the candidates uh, for the city uh, council. Um, we'll transition to the city council candidates at 702. Thank you. We will reconvene in one minute. We will reconvene in one minute. Thank you for your patience. All right, welcome back. We will now um, begin our council candidates portion. We would ask that each and every council um, candidate, please turn on your video and keep your videos on the entire time. Again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. All right. All right. Mute yourselves. There's an echo, my end, I guess, but okay. Welcome back. Um, thank you all for being with us uh, and engaging in these uh, conversations tonight. Um, we have, again, we have uh, candidates from War Two, Christina and um, Bria. We have a candidate from War Three, Wyatt. We have candidates from War Nine, Cliff, Tony, and. Uh, Nasa, Ward 9, Cliff, Tony, and Nasa. Welcome, welcome, welcome. 
We will give each candidate two minutes to introduce themselves and discuss what they see as the most important issue facing the city. We will start first with our Ward 2 candidate, uh, Bria, followed by Christina. Bria, your time starts, uh-oh. Hold on, give me a second. Okay, okay, your time starts now, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Jason. Um, hello, my name is Bria Lewis. I've lived in Corvallis for about three years now. Um, three years actually coming up this October. Um, and I, you know, I really want to serve on city council because Corvallis has, you know, given me the opportunity to have a better life. I had been struggling with living paycheck to paycheck in Maryland, so that's where I'm from. And I was able to have a better chance at life. I was able to, you know, work on myself. And I want to give back to the community that gave me all of these things. And my main concerns are housing, transportation, economic development, and climate change for Ward 2. I, all of those are very complex issues, but I, those are the ones that are most important to me because those are the ones that affect me, that not only affect the community the most, but also affect uh, me personally the most. And I want to ensure that everyone has a chance that I was given in this community. And that's why what better way than to serve as city council. Thank you, Bria. All right, uh, Christina, um, discuss or introduce yourself and discuss why what you see as the most important issues facing the city. Your time starts now. Hi, my background starts with a associate's degree in evidence technology at Phoenix College. I didn't pursue a career with the Phoenix Police Department. I went in a completely different direction. I worked as a field superintendent for new home construction for 20 years. Afterwards, I returned to college and got my bachelor's degree in justice studies at Arizona State University. And shortly thereafter, I received my master's degree in social work specializing in homelessness at Arizona State. During school, I worked for two amazing nonprofits recognized both nationally and internationally, St. Vincent de Paul and Catholic Charities. I did an internship at Catholic Charities where we provided refugee assistance in war-torn countries. And from there, I worked at St. Vincent de Paul at Azana Manor, which is a transitional shelter for disabled and old adults. Moving to Corvallis in 2016, I opened up several businesses, including a dispensary downtown, which is known for my famous sign, pot and pizza. What I think are the most important issues here in Corvallis is the shortage of affordable housing, people experiencing homelessness, climate change and livability. Ward two is on the front lines of homelessness. Downtown business has suffered economic losses due to the pandemic. Residential areas contend with livability issues due to misdemeanor crimes. Climate change also includes the home energy score that will go to the voters as well as parking issues. Thank you, Christina. All right, moving on to Ward 3, Hyatt. Uh, please share with us, uh, introduce yourself uh, and discuss with us what you see as the most important issue facing Corvallis and your time starts now, two minutes. I didn't know I had to turn off my microphone. Thanks, Jason. So my name's Hyatt Lytle. I'm current counselor for Ward 3, which is most of South Corvallis. I uh, wanna first thank the League of Women Voters for having me tonight and thank everyone out there watching and listening and for joining us. Um, a little about myself. I was born and raised here in Corvallis and I'm just finishing my sixth year up on the council. And um, no, I have yet to grow weary of the position. As for my other day job, I work as a support specialist for CASA of Benton and Lincoln counties. As for the most important issues facing Corvallis, um, housing, of course, and this is a very multifaceted issue um, because it includes our houseless neighbors and those who need support. Um, it includes missing segments of housing types and supply, especially workforce housing, single family homes, and the overall lack of affordable housing. 
Um, the next issue would be access when it comes to sustainability, which I think is becoming an increasingly larger conversation in the community, especially as climate issues being so absolute as they are, but access to the solutions and resources for sustainability are not affordable for all. So how can we work on making sustainable efforts and products more affordable and accessible for all income types across the board? Um, local control. There are a lot of state legislative changes being made and happening right now that seem to fit the theme of one metro sized city, city fits all of Oregon cities that are limiting our local control and land use and transportation, such as climate friendly and equitable cities or community rule making. And another issue is we have a major, um, major issues going on with public safety and um, catch and release issues. We are citing over half of our arrests in, in the city of Corvallis. That means that half of arrests are being written just as tickets because there's limited jail space. This is Thank a large you. burden. Thank you, hi. That okay, is thanks, Jason. Thank you. All right, moving on to Ward 9, we'll start with Cliff. Uh, Cliff, introduce yourself and discuss what you see as the most important issues facing the city. Your time starts now. Thank you, Jason, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for uh, this forum tonight. I'm Cliff Feldman. Uh, I've been a Ward 9 resident <clears throat> for over eight years and a Benton County taxpayer for over 16. Um, I've been a lot of things. I'm a husband, a father, a grandfather. I owned a business for 36 years. I was the president of a nonprofit for four years, but I have never been a politician. What I have been is a volunteer. My wife and I both volunteer for the uh, Corvallis Sustainability Coalition, working on water-related projects, and that's very near and dear to us. Uh, we also volunteer at the Majestic Theater. We both <clears throat> served on the board of directors of member-owned Timber Hill Tennis Club. I've coached youth sports for 10 years. As a volunteer, I produce a music show on Corvallis Community Radio Station, KORC. Uh, volunteering is just what I do, and my candidacy for city council is that of a volunteer who wants to make Corvallis the best place I've ever lived. And these are the things I hope to accomplish as your city councilor. I'd like to see more traffic calming techniques to make our streets safer. I walk our neighborhood near the hospital every single day, and I see kids going to school and parents taking children to the park, and I see drivers speeding to the hospital and running red lights on Walnut every day. And what I don't see is traffic enforcement. I'll have conversations with the chief of police and city manager about traffic calming, such as you see on Circle, and more traffic enforcement. I believe that every politician at every level of government must create affordable housing options for everyone who wants to live here and must find safe, stable shelter for the houseless population. Uh, it's October 11th. Yesterday was 80 degrees. We've had almost no rain since July and there is none in the forecast. This is a glimpse of our future. The city and its citizens must look for sustainability in everything we do, planting trees, saving Thank water, you, solarizing homes. Thank you, Cliff. Th okay. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, uh, we're gonna move on to Tony. Tony, tell us a little bit about yourself and what is the most important issues facing the city? Your time starts now. Okay, thank you, Jason. Um, I wanted to introduce myself by sharing some of the uh, key values that have uh, really been driving force in my life. Uh, the value of education, family, hard work, excellence, and service have been instilled in me from my childhood and from my life experience. Um, my parent, I am the second uh, generation son of immigrant parents uh, who came from Mexico. Um, the, my parents had very little education. My mother didn't finish elementary school. My father didn't finish high school, but they did instill in me the values of education, hard work, and doing your best. Um, because of, uh, because of those values, I was able to, with scholarships, work, and contribution from my parents, uh, get a degree, a bachelor's degree in economics and psychology, as well as a master's in business administration from Stanford. Um, very proud of that. Um, I did have a 25-year career with Hewlett-Packard 
um, and re took early retirement in 2007, uh, but I was not done. I have worked as, as a consultant for small business, small to medium businesses, been the CFO at View Plus Technologies here in Corvallis, um, and also for the last 12 years, been a contributing faculty member at Willamette University's Business School. I've also served on numerous boards of nonprofits, most recently here locally, uh, the Arts Center and the Global Nutrition Empowerment. I see the issues facing Corvallis of being livability, pedestrian and traffic safety, uh, responsible development, uh, maintenance and improvement of our infrastructure and addressing climate change. Affordable housing is also a key issue as well as uh, addressing climate change. And I hope to serve uh, as your counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, next up, we have Nasa. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and discuss what you see as the most important issues facing Corvallis. Yes, thank you. First, to let me add my voice to the thank yous for the League of Women Voters and the local branch of the NAACP for hosting this event. And thank you to the community for showing up tonight or listening in later. My name is Nissa Towsley. My pronouns are they, them, or she, her. I am a research administrator working remotely for the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and now I am a city council candidate for Ward 9 asking for your first choice vote. I'm running for council because while I'm not a native of Oregon, ever since moving here, Corvallis has felt like home. The city and its community have been welcoming to me and my family, and I want to do my part to ensure that this wonderful city remains an inclusive and welcoming place for all people, where different communities can thrive and lift each other up. Some of the pressing challenges we face in achieving an inclusive and thriving city are meeting the needs of the unhoused and addressing the pressing need of affordable housing for all members of our community. Another challenge I see is maintaining and enhancing the livability of our city from expanding public transportation service and infrastructure to ensuring robust partnerships with local businesses to careful city planning to make new developments with an eye to needs like walkability, sustainability and mitigating fire risk. Finally, I see a duty for the city to address climate change at the local level by empowering businesses and individuals to make more climate friendly choices through education and through the provision or expansion, expansion of services like res residential composting. In addition, the city must invest in solutions that are designed for long term financial and environmental sustainability. My vision for the leadership necessary to achieve these goals is to center compassion and community voices in all decision making. Being a leader to me, it means having the humility to know when I've reached the limits of my expertise and when it's time to seek input from community experts. As counselor, I would commit to this vision and do everything I can to ensure that our decision-making processes are transparent and accessible to the community. Thank you for having me and I look forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you, thank you and welcome everyone. All right, we have uh, three questions again. Each um, candidate from each ward will have one minute and 30 seconds to respond. Uh, I will read the questions. The first questions will be read to candidates for Ward 2. We will start with Christina, uh, followed by Bria. Christina, the question is, what are the main actions that you think could be done to address the urgent needs of houselessness in Corvallis? Your time starts now. We can't do the same approach as before and expect different results. It's not working. We need to reevaluate our current emergency shelter system and transform the current sheltering system into a co-transitional sheltering option. From there, we need more bridge housing, such as prefab microhomes on its own land. We have big city problems with acute drug addiction and untreated mental health issues. The current data shows that the voluntary mental health resources are underutilized. There are no incentives for people to use these resources, and if they are being used, they are sporadic. Benton County should intervene and develop a medication-assisted treatment, such as a methadone program, which would reduce the use of illegal street drugs, such as fentanyl, heroin, and methamphetamine. Methadone clinics have a proven track record of reducing illegal drug use. There also must be a unified safety net and a willingness to work towards a more robust mental health program by mandating drug treatment programs through community court. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Christina. All right, Brianna, um, uh, Bria, um, what 
turn my camera on here. What are the main actions that you that could be done to address urgent needs of houselessness and crevallis? Your time starts now. Thank you very much. So houselessness is a very complex issue and we need a deep dive into affordable housing, which means like, what does that look like? And it's like, how would, would funds be allocated towards affordable housing being done? There's no such thing as a permanent solution, like a temporary solution. So we need to figure out what those short-term solutions and how to turn those into long-term solutions that includes getting in, that includes making housing more affordable. At the same time, there is a mental health crisis and that is a national, that is a national issue and but there is not enough incentivization for people in the field and if there is incentivization there's a lot of turnover i should know this because i work for a group home for mentally disabled children so that in itself it's a very it's a very draining job but it's also rewarding when you see the progress and that is what we need in ward two on top of this it will also help if we were able to retain graduates from OSU, because a lot of those who are currently here, they're international students and they will immediately go back home. And sometimes they're not even just international students, but they're from different states and they will go back to their different states. So how do we retain the graduates here for you know, boosting our workforce and our community growth? So that way we can actually develop those long-term solutions for housing. I have firsthand experience on, you know, not being able to meet rental expectations and getting, thanks to the Corvallis Services Consortium, um, I was able to get there. I was able to, you know, be able to keep my housing, but you, that Bria. is a very you. limited source. Thank you, Bria. That is your time. Thank you. Right, um, thank you. Ward two, uh, we will start with Hyatt. Um, what are the main actions you think could be done to address the urgent needs of houselessness in Corvallis? Your time starts now. So when I think urgent, I think of the needs for my houseless constituents now, and especially this winter, which starts in less than a month. I'm going to speak to something that I spoke to at the September 19th council meeting, and it is relevant to just South Corvallis. There is a geographic equity disparity when it comes to South Corvallis. South Corvallis has lower social determinants of health. Geographically, South Corvallis is classified as a food desert with two convenience stores or one specialty grocery store in the vicinity. There are a few third places, such as restaurants and social gathering spaces for the community. We have minimal health resources, no real banking or retail. South Corvallis hasn't developed like other areas of Corvallis yet. When tents go up, they stay up in Willamette and Crystal Lake parks, but when tents go up in other places of town, they're taken down in a matter of hours, almost in any other park in Corvallis. There are 49 parks in Corvallis, yet the five parks in Southern Corvallis where camps are being posted back and forth, back and forth again, are all in riparian zones, flood zones, and those all result in life and death issues of our houseless, and they are the ones that we are managing the unmanaged camping. This is what much of houselessness looks like in Corvallis. So I spent a lot of time thinking of how we can look through a lens of geographic equity for this winter for our houseless constituents and how we can share in the solutions. I think following what the Oregon Housing and Community Services, Oregon Supportive Housing Institute's model for permanent supporting housing programs is one of the best directions that communities can take. But most of these models require local government to work with our community partners in order to leverage community solutions. What needs, and that's what needs to happen here in Corvallis. Thank you. Thank you, Hyatt. All right, moving to Ward 9. Uh, we will start with Nessa. What are the main actions that you could be, excuse me, what are the main actions that you think could be done to address the urgent needs of houselessness in Corvallis? Yes, thank you for this question. As a queer person, I am keenly aware of the impacts of houselessness on the queer community, especially queer youth. So this is a personally important issue to me. One of the things I do respect about Corvallis is that it takes the issue of housing seriously and government and nonprofit organizations in the city are working as collaboratively as possible to find compassionate solutions for our most vulnerable community members. 
I think we need to continue some of the programs and approaches we have in the city, such as short and long-term housing support, coordination of social services, and improved responses to mental health crises. The main action I feel is necessary in our response moving forward is increased collaboration between various service providers, as well as enhancing data collection, development of metrics, and implementation of evaluation programs. I believe in the power of data-informed decision-making. Without robust data and evaluation, it is not possible to determine the most effective and efficient responses to problems. In addition, without proof that a program or approach is successful, it is not possible to argue for additional resources to support that program from local, state, or federal levels. Ultimately, I think what is important for Corvallis as a community is for us to think deeply about what community means to us and what kind of community we want to be. It's time to stop vilifying our most vulnerable community members and instead we must act from a place of compassion and a desire to protect everyone who lives here regardless of their income, housing status, mental health needs or other vulnerabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Cliff. What are the main actions that you think could be done to address the urgent needs of houselessness in Corvallis? Thanks, Jason. We have the obligation to shelter the unsheltered in stable, clean, and safe housing. Only when people are sheltered can they be free of the anxiety that colors every decision that they have to make. Only when they and their possessions are safe will they be able to navigate the rest of life's challenges obtaining food, gaining access to services, medical care, and finally uh, having the opportunity to gain employment. So we start with the 2019 homeless, Homelessness in Oregon report, which says that more emergency shelters are required, but they're not the ultimate answer. They're a first response option. The city and county need to access funds from the state's Project Turnkey 2.0, which has $50 million in funds, uh, there was a Project Turnkey 1.0 uh, two years ago, uh, which, in which Benton County did not access those funds. So we, it's our turn to access funds and build or purchase defunct hotels, uh, motels, and other vacant space to convert to shelter. Ultimately, the city and the county need to add affordable housing for all levels of income. Oregon currently has a shortfall of 110,000 homes for residents. At the city level, we have to add housing for everyone by re-examining zoning and identifying locations for both existing and convertible space and new housing. With the pause in growth at OSU and the continued pressure of the general population growth, the city must emphasize affordable housing and use infill wherever possible to keep our city compact. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. All right, um, Tony, what are the main actions that you think could be done to address the urgent needs of houselessness in Corvallis? Oh, so I'll be the first to admit that I have a lot to learn here and I'm working to educate myself in this arena. Uh, I would want to uh, learn what other cities and states have found to be effective. Um, I know there are some success stories out there and I would want to explore uh, that is a possibility. I'd also like to explore the extent to which there is a coordinated approach to serving the various demographics in the unhoused population. By that, I mean, I imagine that there are different solutions that are needed for different segments of the unhoused population. There's a lot of difference between those that are struggling with mental health issues and substance abuse and of the population. See us build on successes and better coordinate between various government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and service providers. My objective would be to help those who are unhoused live their best lives, to move towards attainable goals, and to progress in a way that addresses livability for all. Building more tra transitional housing is important, more reliable and sustainable shelter or temporary housing, expanding our capacity for mental health and substance abuse services is critical. Um, and so I would really be looking uh, to see if there could be increased alignment between city, county, state, and local organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. All right, question two, and we will start with Ward two, um, Bria, followed by Christina. Question two, how will you work how will you work to ensure 
public input is represented in Corvallis government. Your time starts now. So I believe that, you know, for the public concerns to be compared with the current and proposed policies of the city council and of course with Benton County to better integrate the community in the decision making and feel heard by the people they have elected. But what is an elected official if not a representation of that small part of the community that they are involved in and being on the hope for that is a firsthand experience that we have seen and experienced who talking to different nonprofits, organizations, and different groups, trying to figure out what policies and what can be done to integrate all of that together to make sure that those concerns are heard and we're actively listening to the public and making sure that whatever the public needs is being considered when making the decisions that impact the entire community and not just a few. Thank you. Okay, Christina, um, how will you work to ensure that public input is represented in the Corvallis government? Your time starts now. I think Corvallis really needs to be commended here. There are 2,243 registered voters in Ward 2. That means there are 2,243 issues and every issue is worth consideration. The good news is, is that the people of Corvallis are very engaged in their community. They are engaged in government and they love to explain their point of view. The challenge is maintain, managing their concerns so they don't go down the drain. More recently, Corvallis adopted the IAP2 process, which is the International Association for Public Participation. This promotes sustainable decisions through public participation and a good example of that is the Green New Deal that was just passed by City Council. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to, uh, let's see, War 3 um, with Hyatt. How will you ensure that public input is represented in Corvallis government? Your time starts now. I think that many can agree that public involvement took a bit of a hit during the pandemic, even though we learned some new ways to engage and gain some new tools like online meetings and forums such as this. But we lost some of the in person connection that occurs, for instance, um, interactions like testifying in person at city council meetings having conversations at community events and those good old fashioned open houses at the library. I feel like we're still in a transitory time where the council has just been bringing back in-person meetings for about five months now. Um, the council also adopted the International Association of Public Participation model that um, Councilor Jen Silla was just talking about um, during the pandemic, which is new, but it prioritizes public engagement early into public processes. I am a firm believer that listening is probably the most important part of my job as a counselor. And if I've learned one thing, along the way is that it's probably the most important thing that my constituents feel heard. Public process doesn't work when people don't feel heard and when government doesn't listen. I will continue to promote public input early and I also plan on representing more voices that we do not hear from. Last year during the development of the city's strategic operation plan, I proposed an item to explore a community youth council because I believe there is a huge gap in hearing from our community's youth. I intend to begin fulfilling this item after speaking with other counselors around the state who have different youth action councils. I want to continue finding those missing voices from the table when it comes to public input and get them involved, informed, and aware of city processes early. Thank you. Thank you, Hyatt. Um, moving on to Ward 9, and we'll start with Cliff. How will you work to ensure that public input is represented in Corvallis government? Well, as a total newbie, Jason, um, I plan on having uh, monthly Zoom meetings for constituents. Uh, this council seat that I'm running for is not about me. It's to fully represent the residents of Ward 9. And the only way to do that is to invite public input, not only for uh, ward meetings, but for council meetings generally as well. 
Uh, I'll reach out to residents by every means possible from social media to my website, to the city site, and by continuing to ask questions. That's how you learn. Starting at a local level is the best way to assure that uh, the growth and the health of a democratic society. I'll ask that the city be as inclusive as possible in everything that it does, particularly in its outreach to residents. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. All right, uh, next to respond to that question um, will be Tony. Uh, Tony, how will you work to ensure that public input is represented in Corvallis government? Well, as I've talked with both neighbors and people active in government, I'm struck by two observations. First, Corvallis as a city has admirable goals and processes for gathering public input. I've participated in that process as I gave testimony to the Planning Commission on the city's changes to the Land Development Code as part of the middle housing implementation. Second, as I talk with friends and neighbors, I'm also struck by how many, how, how many people know very little about significant topics until quite late or even after a decision has been made. I saw elements of this in the middle housing code project update. So you have those who think that they, they don't, they're not aware and they don't have input and those that feel there is a great opportunity for input. I think that my takeaway from this is not to argue which viewpoint is right, but to recognize that we have room for improvement. Uh, I believe more outreach and assessment of public sentiment, um, perhaps by more frequent surveys or outreach at the farmer's market or better use of social media. I aim to do my part as a Ward 9 counselor to be more effective and inclusive in my outreach and to gather input that needs further discussion. I do know that making decisions where a significant percentage of the residents feel that their voices are not heard does not make for wise, sustainable, or satisfactory decisions. I think we can do better here. Thank you. All right, and to round us out, um, Nessa? How will you, excuse me, how will you work to ensure that public input is represented in Corvallis government? Thank you for this question. So my current line of work involves supporting an ethics committee embedded in a public university. And that ethics committee is required by law to oversee research involving people and people's private information. The laws governing these ethics committees require that the committees have diverse representation because diversity of perspective is necessary to fully assess risks, benefits, and scientific merit. Ensuring diversity of perspectives on an ethics committee means first and foremost, having the humility to understand and admit when your own expertise has reached its limit. Second, it requires being mindful, looking around the table and seeing who is not there, who needs to be there in order to fill those gaps in ex expertise and experience, and then making a concerted effort to find that expertise. I would bring this approach to local government. That is, again, having the humility to know when our perspectives or expertise as a governing body is limited and committing to thoughtfully examining the problem to identify where we can shore up our limitations by bringing in the appropriate expertise. Specific strategies for ensuring the inclusion of community input might include creating or reinstating community advisory boards, hosting public forums, and in doing so, offering virtual as well as in-person venues for community input, and offering synchronous as well as asynchronous opportunities for community input, and leveraging our community leaders and organizations to get the word out about these opportunities to provide input. Because we can put it out there in the world that we want public input, but if no one knows that we're seeking it, we're not going to get it. So increasing our outreach efforts to and educate the community about how they can participate is important. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, our third and final question before we move into Q&A from our um, residents. Um, we'll start with Ward 2, uh, and Christina will kick us off. Uh, from a justice and equity lens, how does accountability look to you as a city councilor? Uh, your time starts now, Christina. Corvallis has demonstrated in language and in action that everyone must have equitable access to opportunity and justice. Corvallis and Benton County created clear action plans with built-in institutional accountability mechanisms to achieve racial equity. Again, Corvallis needs to be commended on this. A city councilor and as a social worker, I recognize ways in which representation and justice 
contribute to inequality. Socioeconomic status and incarceration disproportionately impacts low-income families and people of color. Corvallis has systems in place to correct discrimination and creates equitable opportunities by contributing to the changes towards greater equity for all families in Corvallis. Diversity makes our community stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Bria, how will you work to ensure, excuse me, Bria, from a justice and equity lens, how does accountability look to you as a city councilor? And your time starts now. Accountability, accountability to me looks like active listening and taking on those concerns of the community when making both long-term long and short-term decisions. Um, as a person of color and as a queer woman with a partner, I know firsthand what it's like to be unjustified, like unjustly, you know, targeted. And it's like, you know, it's like just because I am a woman, I can't do certain things. Just because I'm gay, there's a target on my back. And so I know firsthand experience what that feels like. And I want to ensure that with me being on council, that that would be alleviated by actively listening to the concerns of the people and figuring out what actions that the council can take regarding those decisions. And I feel like in my heart of hearts that someone having a face they can actually look at and talk to, you know, would actually be beneficial for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to Ward 3, Hyatt. From a justice and equity lens, how does accountability look to you as a city councilor? Sure. Thanks, Jason. Um, racial justice and equity are a large part of my moral fiber and daily practice as a human being. Um, until recently, it was difficult for me to open up about my own personal journey as a multiracial female in Corvallis and politics and even in America today. Accountability for myself personally is staying educated, informed, and exploring what may or may not be implicit bias. As a counselor, I believe one of the best ways I can continue to be accountable is to reach out to minorities in my ward and having conversations and listening. My own philosophy is to always go to people and not rely on people coming to you. There are many venues in South Corvallis I can continue to explore to meet new people and build those relationships and continue these conversations. Lincoln School being a dual immersion school provides opportunities to meet parents and children. Third Street Commons and the Hygienics Center allow connections with houselessness or houseless constituents that do have a large contingent of people of color. And there's cultural, cultural events in the Tunison community neighbor, or neighborhood room. And um, I also had the honor of, or have the honor of currently chairing um, the city's newly appointed diversity, equity, and inclusion task force. So if elected, I will hope to advocate for the policy recommendations that come out of our work that we are charged by council to finish by the end of this year. As a task force, we did agree that we want to do quality work over meeting deadlines. So if that work is unfinished, I will carry it forward. My hope is that those recommendations that do come from our work will promote important discussions to take place, leave us with a policy board that will provide a DEI lens when it comes to viewing important city policies, new and existing, and establish a precedent for more task forces of this nature. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ward 9, we'll start with Tony. Uh, from a justice and equity lens, how does accountability look to you as a city councilor? Um, so I'll start with accountability, which I, which to me means taking ownership for decisions and actions, being clear about what actions were taken and why, and communicating with those to whom one is responsible. Uh, being transparent is a key part of accountability, and I also think that accountability includes learning from and adjusting uh, to best meet the objective of agreed upon goals. From a uh, creating conversation, setting goals, prioritizing actions from a justice and equity lens means creating an environment of openness and inclusion and working collaboratively to achieve desired aims. It means fostering the empowerment of uh, underserved or marginalized community. 
one of the things that I think is, is very near and dear to my heart is the power of hope and aspiration and the feeling of empowerment that can transform people's lives. I have certainly felt that in my own life. Um, and as the father of uh, two girls, now women, um, who are mixed race, I, I, I believe that I have always tried to provide um, that environment of knowing that uh, and helping them to feel empowered and work to remove obstacles, um, which I think is the most powerful thing that we can achieve in this realm. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we'll move to uh, Misa. From a justice and equity lens, how does accountability look to you as a city councilor? Yes, thank you. To me, accountability is inextricable from transparency. If the processes behind decision making are not transparent, then there can be no accountability because there's no way for the public to judge the appropriateness of the decision making process. Especially from a justice and equity lens, this means making government processes and decision making as accessible to the most number of people as possible. For me, that would mean continuing to make city council meetings and deliberations available online, but also providing education and outreach to the community about how to access those materials, because if nobody knows about them, then it's not truly transparent. Finally, I believe that accountability is not possible without equity and inclusion. If certain groups are excluded from discussions of important topics, then we can't say that we are being adequately held accountable because we are ignoring whole sects of our community. So accountability looks like including the most people possible when we gather input, make decisions, and share the results of our decision-making processes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we'll move on to Cliff. Um, give me one second to pull the question back up, Cliff. My apologies. Um, Cliff, from a justice and equity lens, how does accountability look to you as a city councilor? Well, um, whenever uh, a citizen is concerned, <clears throat> for example, about litter in the parks or potholes on the road or reduced bus service, their first point of contact is their local council member. And above all else, uh, being a counselor means being an advocate for the well being and the safety of residents. And I will work to ensure that all residents are treated fairly by the policies and the rulings enacted by the council. First and foremost is to assure that all voices are being heard and all points of view are being expressed. That's why public in input is so important to me personally, and it will guide me as I seek the best answers to the most difficult questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for being with us on this evening. That concludes our um, questions that we have uh, prepared for the, for the candidates. Uh, we will now transition uh, to the Q&A from the residents. Uh, and um, give each um, candidate one minute to respond to each, actually 45 seconds to respond to each, each question. We're trying to make up some, some time here. Uh, and so I'm just gonna kind of go down the, down the list here uh, and get to as many as we can. So uh, Cliff, let's actually start, start with you, if that's okay. Uh, sure. What actions will you encourage in order to ensure a robust public process in Corvallis? Well, uh, I outlined uh, that for me personally, I really feel very strongly about being in touch with uh, the constituents of Ward 9 as much as I can. Now, obviously, these decisions that are ultimately made are citywide decisions. So it's simply a matter of, I won't say it simply, it's a matter of um, as, as much outreach as possible because you, you want to include everyone citywide. And for me, obviously it starts locally. If someone's walking down the street and they have an issue, they're gonna contact me about that issue. But for, from a city standpoint, um, you, you simply want as much inclusion as possible and as much transparency as possible. The city government is, is a, a, 
at the the best level it's the most by the people for the people that exists in the country there's no level of government that's closer to the people than city council thank you cliff uh tony same question um what what actions will you encourage in order to ensure a robust public access a public process in Corvallis? Well, I think starting at the uh, at the ward level, I do plan uh, outreach and um, by whatever means, uh, be it in-person meeting, uh, be it uh, um, online meetings, uh, coffee talks, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think that uh, what's what the key takeaway for me in this question is, that there are a variety of ways in which our uh, residents want to interact with. Some are social media folks, some prefer in person, uh, some prefer coffee talks, uh, town hall meetings, et cetera. Uh, I think it's important uh, to really access all of the avenues for interaction as well. I think it's important to use uh, information in a more structured manner, such as surveys and outreach uh, as well. Thank you. All right. Oh, uh, uh, Nissa, uh, <clears throat> what actions will you encourage in order to ensure a robust public process in Corvallis? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think there are only so many ways you can do um, in public engagement, and my uh, my fellow candidates here have uh, touched on a lot of them in terms of engaging with people on social media, making yourself available virtually or in person for meetings. Um, I also think that um, and my candidacy does not end after the election. The door knocking doesn't have to end. Um, we can still engage the community by going out to them. Um, I believe it was Hyatt who said that you can't rely on people coming to you, you have to go to them. And so I think that's an important strategy as well. Um, and finally, I do um, really love the idea of more formalized data gathering. I'm a bit of a data nerd. I'm kind of in the science field. Um, and so I think more formalized surveys or polls of our constituents is a great way to get feedback as well. Thank you. Uh, new question, uh, Hyatt. Uh, let's see. Um, what are your Hyatt, What are your thoughts about the home energy score proposal for scoring residents for sale? What are my thoughts on it? Yes. Um, well, that is a um, that's a hard one um, because it was uh, it became very contentious, and that's probably a very well suited one for me because I never actually got to speak on the night on the ordinance. Um, so the night before um, or the day before, uh, Councillor Struthers and I spent a lot of time working on the ordinance um, to make it into something that um, we felt that was something really, you know, worthy of our city. Um, we found some errors in it as the ordinance currently stands. Um, you, if you sell an RV or a tiny home, um, you have to get a home energy score done on it, which I felt was, um, we had an amendment, I had an amendment ready for that that night. Um, and there was a lot that I wanted to say that night. And I ended up voting on the motion to um, take it to the voters because I wasn't able to speak that night. So I'm happy to share that with the community because I had a lot to say and I had a lot of amendments to make. So that's where I stand. Thank you. Thank you. That's your time. Thank you so much. Um, let's swing it to uh, Ward 2, uh, Bria and Christina. Um, this is your question. Now that Corvallis lacks a truly local newspaper, and fewer constituents read the paper we do have, how do you propose engaging your constituents on the issues in front of the council? Uh, Bria, and then we'll swing it to Christina. Thank you. So I am very, very active on social media. I mean, I have a Facebook page, I have Instagram, I have Twitter. So I love keeping up with news and I love sharing that news with people. Um, I actually would love to see a re, like a, a renaissance for newspapers in a sense. Like I would love to see like more like local newspaper, like more, cause I know we have a lot of 
local journalists that are just like, you know, freelancers. Um, but I would love to see our community come together and put something together to just highlight what the main concerns and what's going on in our community. Um, and if that's not the case, I would love to do it myself. Um, again, I am that's, all- That's I'm, your time. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Christina, uh, and uh, Christina, um, same question. Now that Quavales lacks a truly local newspaper and fewer constituents read the paper we do have, how do you propose engaging your constituents on issues in front of the council? Well, as I said previously, my business is well known in Corvallis. Anybody can find me and my door is always open. So I'm available to everyone. I live, work and play in Ward 2. I always go out of my way to engage constituents in issues that affect our lives. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see, we may have time if you, if you all are really quick with the candidates um, to, to ask, answer one more question. This one is gonna be under 30 seconds. I'm gonna ask the same question to everyone, under 30 seconds. Um, okay, oh God, it's gonna be a loaded one, but we'll see what we can do. Um, <laughs> in light of, a recent uptick in traffic violence, if elected to council, can you commit to making sure that the city of Corvallis is able to discuss the establishment of a vision zero task force? Actually, this should be a yes or no. I'm reading it again. In light of recent uptick in traffic violence, if elected to city council, can you commit to making sure Corvallis City Council is able to discuss the establishment of a Vision Zero Task Force. And we'll start with Christina. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, Hyatt? Yes, it's been on the pending item list on the three month calendar for a long time now. Thank you, Bria? A hundred percent, absolutely. Thank you, Cliff. Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Nisa. Yep, for sure. Thank you, Tony. Tony. Oh, sorry about that. Yes, but I also want to make sure that we actually put the resources behind it. Also. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Did I get everyone? I believe I did. All right. Now we are coming to the tail end of this awesome evening in which we're going to provide each candidate or each, each candidate will have an opportunity to share with residents of this awesome city why we should vote for you. We will start with Ward 2, Christina, one minute, followed by Bria. Your time starts now. Thank you. Going back to 2016, We've been trying to solve the homeless crisis, affordable housing, and livability issues. Six years later, we're still trying to solve the same issues. We must take a new approach to address the issues and act with urgency. We must have the political will to solve these crises at the local level. We cannot wait for some other person or some other time. We cannot use the same approach and expect different results. We are the ones to make change happen with a clear action plan, change can come quickly. Improvements, improvement results in change and change is what we seek. The result will be a more vibrant and inclusive community. Thank you. Thank you and best of luck. Uh, Bria, final comments, one minute. Bria, I'm sorry, Bria, you're, you're, you're muted. There we go. I am so sorry. Thank you. Yeah, one minute. Corvallis has given me something that I did not have in Maryland where I grew up, a chance to have a better life. No matter, like no better way to give back to a community that has given me so much than to be on city council. As a person of color, as a, as a lesbian, and as someone who is willing to do the work, I will bring a new perspective to council and I would love to be your first choice. Thank you. 
All right, Ward three, one minute, Hyatt. Oh, wow. I guess I didn't prepare for this. So um, I have absolutely enjoyed these past six years. Um, I have not grown tired. I absolutely have loved serving the people of South Corvallis, of Corvallis. And um, if elected, I will continue to fight for um, that geographic equity disparity we see in South Corvallis. Um, urban renewal. We're going to get that rolling. Um, we are going to get some transportation issues fixed in South Corvallis, and um, we are going to continue working on housing, access to sustainability, and um, that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, Hyatt. Best of luck. Ward 9, um, one minute. Uh, Nesta. I think I just want to say thank you again to League of Women Voters and the local branch of the NAACP for putting on this event. It's been really great. Um, I guess I just kind of want to wrap up by saying that the reason I am asking for your first choice vote is because I'm not going to pretend that I have all the answers. Um, my perspectives as a queer person, as a woman, as a neurodivergent person, give me important and valuable insights that I want to share. But I know that those are not the only valuable insights that are out there and that there are other aspects of my identities that have given me privilege that um, don't allow me to see certain things um, very easily. And so I think what is important to me, again, is centering compassion and community Community voices in local government here in Corvallis to keep this an inclusive and wonderful city. Thank you so much. Thank you and best of luck. Uh, Cliff, final comments, one minute. Um, thanks, Jason, the NAACP and the League of Women Voters for having us. Um, so I want Corvallis to work for you. Uh, this campaign is not really about me. It's about you, the people that live here. Uh, I'm going to invite anyone out there to contact me and ask questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll help you find it. I believe in inclusion, transparency, and democracy. We have a lot of work to do in the areas of housing for everyone who want to live here, and we have a lot of work in climate action. We have to educate ourselves in ways to save water and energy. Let's find ways to use our cars less and take advantage of Corvallis's compact size. My vision is that Corvallis be a welcoming place that values everyone's contribution. Please visit my site, cliffward9corvallis.com and please vote for me as your first choice. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff, and best of luck. And last, but certainly not least, Tony. Thank you, Jason, the NAACP and the League of Women Voters. Um, as a longtime Corvallis resident, I'll bring to the city council a proven track record and diversity of experience and learnings from large and small business, higher education, and the nonprofit sector. I'll work hard, listen well, and work with all to make sound, fiscally responsible, and pragmatic solutions with clear, achievable outcomes. I have not and will not accept funding from any person or organization. And I hope you give me the opportunity to represent you. Uh, know that I will represent you. I hope that you vote for me for, as your first choice or your second choice, but I will represent you even if you do not vote for me at all. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Tony, and best of luck. And thank you to all of our candidates for our city council. Um, wards, as well as the mayoral candidates. Um, and thank you all, our residents, for engaging with us over these, over these two hours. It's certainly been indeed my honor to serve as your moderator uh, and to uh, facilitate such rich and vibrant conversations. Uh, in closing, we certainly would like to thank um, the sponsors, uh, the, the, the League of Women Voters and the NAACP um, for hosting this uh, session on tonight. Our mayor and the wards and the ward nine city council race are the two races with three candidates, and where ranked choice voting will come into play in the city for the first time. I want to repeat that again: the mayor, the mayor race, and the ward nine city council race are the two races with three candidates, and and where ranked choices choice voting will come into play in the city for the first time. Learn more about the ranked choice voting. Just guys place a link in the chat. 
uh, and uh, be sure to uh, prepare yourself to vote. Um, again, thank you all so much. Uh, I send you all of the, the all, everything I have to each and every one of, of, of the candidates uh, and do have a great evening. And I will be remiss if I did not uh, promote the upcoming uh, Freedom Fund celebration that the NAACP is hosting on October the 29th. Please visit NAACP Lynn Benton, um, LynnBenton.com to purchase your ticket. Thank you all so much, and I wish you well. Good night. Thank you.